Hi, I am Mirko Böhm, an authorized Qt trainer from KDAB. Welcome to this learning video based on the material for the Qt Essentials training course. With these videos, we'll be giving you key insights into Qt. We will also demonstrate the type of in-depth training available in the classroom-based Qt Essentials training course. In the following video, we'll be discussing events in Qt applications. The video complements the previous videos on the Qt object model and the signal and slot mechanisms. You will sometimes hear that GUI applications are event-driven. What this means is that these applications are running a central event loop and that all events that are processed by the application are passed through that event loop to the receivers. If you think back at the existing Qt source code that we've already discussed, there was always the call to app.exec at the end of main. This is effectively what starts the event loop and this call returns when the event loop has ended. So all the applications that we have written so far had an event loop and were event driven, even if we didn't know about it. So the first question is, where do the events come from? The events can originate from outside the program. For example, the keyboard is not owned by the application, so the operating system or the windowing system will tell us that a keyboard key was pressed. And there are other events that are created within the application. For example, a timer could go off or the application itself programmatically could call for an update of the user interface. The programmatic methods will also lead to the creation of events and they will be added to the same event queue. The events in event queue will be processed in the order they were received. Some of them will not be processed at all, but they will not bypass other events. Every event has a specific receiver. The receiver is a queue object of any kind. And when the event is processed by the event loop, it will be handed to that receiving object. The receiving object. The receiving object will then determine what happens as a result of the event being processed. Some events are ignored. Some, for example, lead to the widget repainting. We will now have a closer look at the different event handler functions that the objects have and how you can re-implement them to change the behavior of your widgets or queue objects. The most generic event handler that queue objects have is the method event on queue object itself. It is called for all events that this object receives. So, you could technically process all events that your object receives in that single function. But that is very inconvenient because there's, there are very many events and they're very different. So, instead what we're using are specialized event handlers. So, for example, QWidget has event handlers for mouse press events. Now you see that it's way more specific than handling any kind of event. Or a key press event. And when your widget receives that uh, that event, this function will be called and the function will be called with a parameter that tells you, like for example, which key was pressed or where the mouse was clicked. Now first of all, if your class doesn't re-implement that event handler function, because it's a virtual function, the implementation of your base class will be called. So for example, unless you overload the mouse press event in your queue widget that, in your widget that you're implementing, the mouse press event handler of queue widget will be called. And that usually does nothing. Second, now once you receive an event, there are two things that can happen. The event can be accepted. This means that your widget takes the event and declares that it takes care of processing the event. The event can also be ignored. This means that you are rejecting to handle the event. In this case, event propagation takes place. Event propagation means that now this event is delivered to your parent object. And um, not to the base class, to the parent object. That's an important difference in this case. And the parent object can then decide to handle this event or not. This is, for example, useful if you have key presses that your widget cannot process, but your parent container widget could potentially process these key presses. If you're ignoring them, they will go up to the parent widget. The application we're looking at here will be showing a main window, a top-level window, and what we're trying to achieve is that in case the user tries to close this window, there will be a message box asking the user if the window should close or not. And if the user chooses not to, the window should not close. This means that we have to intercept the event that closes the window. When we receive it, we'll have to show the message box. And if the user says, no, I don't want to close the window, then we will have to somehow make the event not work. So let's have a look. First of all, we look at the main function. The main function looks very familiar by now. We have a special widget class here that we're instantiating, we're showing it, and we execute the event loop. So line 50 here is 
what executes the event loop. And um, here's the widget class. So we're inheriting key widget and we're overloading in line 55 the close event handler. The close event is sent to top level windows when the user is trying to close them. And if the close event is ignored, then the windows is not closed. So this is exactly how we want to, how we could influence that behavior. So let's look at the implementation of this close event, close event function. It's here. You can jump between header and implementation in Qt Creator by hitting F2. That's what I just did. So I jumped right to the close event function here. You see that we are, we have a little helper function here that says the window should close or not. And if the window should close, we accept the event and else we ignore it. Now you've seen in the slide previously that if we ignore it, this event will be propagated to parent widgets. Now we're a top level widget, so we don't have a parent, which means this is about the end of this event. There will be nothing else happening. What does the should, window should close function do? Well, we're showing a message box here, and this message box asks the user if the window should really close, and offers the buttons yes and no. And if the answer is yes, then we return true. And if the answer is no or anything else but yes, then we return false. So if the user clicks no, then window should close, returns false, and the event is ignored. So let's run the application and see if this has the desired effect. Of course it will, because we know. So this is our window. It says try to close the window, and if I now click on the close button here, what we're expecting is a message box asking for it. Yes, so that means that the close event was now delivered to the application, delivered to the event handler of our widget class, and in this, in this event handler we're now showing this message box. Let's say no. You see that the window is not closing, which means that the event, because it is ignored, is not processed and the window is not closed. Let's try it again and say yes. And there you see that the application has exited. So this is an example on, of how to do custom event handling. You overload the existing event handler function. It's important to see that this is a function on the QWidget base class that you're overloading. And only because you overload it, this function will be called and the base class function will not be called anymore. The event handler functions are virtual. Events can be accepted or ignored, and depending on that, the window, in this case, for example, closes or not. So this concludes this demo. The one thing we have to discuss before this video will end is how do signals and slots contrast to events? Because we have two mechanisms that sound like they're doing about the same thing, but not quite. So the last open question is, how do signals and slots contrast to events. We have seen how you could achieve about the same behavior with signals and slots and events, but still both are used in Qt applications and are serving slightly different purposes. The biggest difference between the two is that an event always has a specific sender and a specific receiver. So every event can only be processed by a single object. While if you look at signals and slots, Connections to a single signal can be made from different objects. So you can have multiple objects being called if one signal is emitted by a certain object. It also works the other way around. So multiple signals can be connected to the same slot uh, on one object, even from different senders, which means that effectively signal-slot connections are end-to-end -end ways of communication, while events are only going to one specific receiver and can only trigger one specific action. That's also why you see that in many Qt applications, events actually are translated to signals. For example, the mouse click on a button is usually translated to a triggered signal of this button. So the signal represents a higher meaning than the in initial click. The click is something physical that happened, and the, 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 um, the fact that the button was triggered has a meaning to the program, a semantic. And this is how we're usually differentiating between um, signals and slots and events. 
we say that signals usually have some kind of semantic meaning for the application, while events are something that happens spontaneously, physically, in the application, um, and is then processed at a certain spot, one event handler of one object. What to use effectively is a matter of experience, so programmers have to develop a feeling of what functionality to implement using signals and slots, and what functionality to implement with events. There is an, an overlap where the same things can be achieved with both mechanisms. This concludes our video about Qt events, and it also concludes the series of videos about the Qt object model. The series dealt with the Qt object model itself, with signals and slots, and now finally with events. We hope that you enjoyed this taste of the Qt Essentials training. For the full experience, including labs, Q's, and Q&As, and additional information, we recommend that you attend the full multi-day Qt Essentials training course. The course is available from KDIB or any of the other Qt training partners. For full information, check out qt.nocare.com. Thanks for watching.